Hi there, and welcome to the podcast, Life as a, a show intently focused on helping people find their professional pathway by exploring and unearthing the details of jobs from around the world. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. Live musical performance, when done well, can be oh so gripping. The mixing of spirit, energy, and connection makes for almost palpable experiences. And perhaps it has to do with it being so pure and earnest from the standpoint of emotional and artistical expression and accompanied release. For all intents and purposes, the taking in of these visceral and melodious happenings could easily be considered as part of the human condition. And history would back you up on most of this. Research indicates live performances may have started over 100,000 years ago during prehistoric times. Fast forwarding a bit, in ancient Greece and Rome, live musical entertainment really took off, with it firmly entrenching itself into important aspects of culture. Since then, the heartbeat of live music more or less has been rhythmically pumping. On today's show, we have a guest who has built a successful professional career based around this notion of promoting live musical artistry and expression. Her insights on modern day musical performance will be of interest to anyone wanting to know where it may all be headed. Laura Simpson is the CEO and co-founder, along with artist Dan Mangan of Side Door, a Canadian tech startup founded in 2017. Side Door's mission is to create shows anytime, anywhere, first with in-person shows and now online. The platform marketplace is built to connect artists with curators, venues, service providers, and audiences to make booking, ticketing, and payments easy, fair, and transparent. Sidor provides robust tools and support without any upfront costs to the artist. Laura herself has spent much of her life serving the needs of artists and promoting live performance. Since 2007, she has worked with various music organizations and festivals, including Music Nova Scotia, Halifax Jazz Festival, East Coast Music Awards, Kapakoa, and the Halifax Pop Explosion. She has hosted house concerts at the Halifax Canada-based Syrup Factory since 2011. In 2015, she went to Los Angeles for four months to mentor with the former president of Warner Brother Records. Upon returning, she evolved the Syrup Factory into an artist services company. She believes experiencing amazing live art in intimate community settings leads to stronger human connection, greater empathy, and improved mental health. With all that stated, Laura, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the show. Hi there. Pleasure to meet you too, Christopher. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited to, to get into all this. I mean, with music, I mean, who's not a fan of it to begin with? And uh, I just think your career and what you've built around this notion of music and artistry is uh, is really quite compelling. So uh, yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to speak about it with you. So why don't we? And I do have this first segment, something called Coloring Wikipedia. As my guests would know, it's a segment where I just read off a definition of what the guest does. I do it for a few reasons. One, it brings everybody up to speed on what the actual profession is about. And then two, I think, you know, we as individuals or professionals, we could hold the same title, but oftentimes we put our own stamp on things, you know, just the way we do our job, it could be different. So it offers this kind of interesting jumping off point for the discussion. So with that in mind, I do have you down here for startup founder. All right. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> Great from Wikipedia. It's going to be a little bit dry, probably wordy a little bit too, and quite general. So as I read this off, maybe in the context of what you've done, you know, you can kind of uh, think about that and then comment afterwards. Does this sound good? Yeah. All righty. Here we go. Startup founder. A startup is a company or a project undertaken by an entrepreneur to seek, develop, and validate a scalable business model. While entrepreneurship refers to all new businesses, including self-employment and businesses that never intend to become registered, startups refer to new businesses that intend to grow large beyond the solo, solo founder. At the beginning, startups face high uncertainty and have a high rate of failure, but a minority of them do go on to be successful and influential. Founders or co-founders are people involved in the initial launch of startup companies and are responsible for the overall strategy of the startup. There it is, Laura. What, what do you think? First off, yeah, first take. That's, that's pretty accurate, I think. Yeah. 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 Wikipedia gets a pass on this one? Yeah, they get a pass. All right. In terms of, I guess, you know, what you do at Side Door, 
um, I don't know. Would, would you like to add anything to the def to the uh, definition, or even you know, take anything away? Would you say? Or... I mean, there's maybe a bit of soul that I would inject into that because we're definitely, um, you know, a purpose driven company. So uh, I think that's maybe something I would add into it. Yeah, scalability mm. for um, like a greater good for sure. Yeah, yeah. I guess I got this other question here. I mean, startups and that whole world and those experiences, I mean, there's certain elements and issues. It's been written up at large. It's online content, magazines, books, there's tons, right? And there's like this common knowledge of do's, don'ts, all these different things. But I also sort of think that like for each entrepreneur, their path is a little bit unique. You know, it's different. Every business is a little bit different. And in that vein, you know, how would your experience be or how has your experience been with Side Door in that sense? Like what, what what's made that experience of launching and running that company different, I suppose? Well, I guess I never really set out to be a startup founder. I think if you were to like, I just went to a conference last week called the Atlantic Venture Forum. So it was filled with investors and founders and people who support that ecosystem. Yeah. And I would say probably the majority of folks in there, it's, you know, not their first company. They're um, specifically interested in, um solving a pro problem usually it is something related to their own life but it is yeah a scalable thing that they want to you know innovate and change the world in some way or another a lot of times it's money focused so you you know you hear that you know people are looking for big exits or you know being acquired or going public and that sort of thing um i think when dan and i founded this company it was around solving a problem that the scale was huge um, and the way that we wanted to solve it would be by doing something that would require scale to succeed. Because mm -hmm. um, otherwise we would be, I was you know, running a services based company before and doing one-to-one -one support, um, but really we wanted systematic change. So I think that's, that's their, there's similarities there and sort of the approach of solving a problem and the scalability of it. But maybe the difference is, is that, you know, this is not, I don't have a plan B. This is, this is the company that I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, and I didn't get into it because I'm really into startup life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. I hear you. Yeah. It was passion driven. It sounds like, right. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. It must be interesting. I, I'm just thinking when I was, I was you know listening to you speak there, you know, this kind of, at least the image of, of that sort of world might be a little bit cold, a little bit corporate, right? And whereas like musical artistry and entertainment on that side of things seems like such a polar opposite. So bringing those, marrying those two sort of worlds together must be really interesting. There must be some, some times there where things kind of, I don't know, challenge your own ideals or, or you know, ideas on, on what certain things mean. I, I'm guessing at least. Maybe you yeah, can. I... I think that there's definitely opposites at play between the startup world and the music industry because, and I, I would spend most, I do spend most of my time in the music world. Like most of the places when I go traveling in the next month, um, all of it is to do with music. It's not startup conferences. It's not meeting with investors. It's actually, I'm specifically interested in being in the music industry and working with those artists and those industry people and people who want to host shows. So when I take a toe dip back into the startup world and I do like I did last week and I went to this venture conference, um, you know, I was on a panel and I was just speaking about, you know, the power of art and, you know, like how we value art and how we compensate artists and that sort of thing. And so many people came up to me afterwards to say, you know, I hadn't really thought about it in the way you spoke. And, you know, thank you for speaking about that. And I, you know, I'm not, I, you know, I gave up my artist career. There's usually a, a, a closeted artist who comes up, right, but right. you, you, are, it's like this opportunity to bring this um, heart and soul to the startup world in a way. So it, it's fun. Like I, you know, I, I love playing that on in the music side. Nobody even like, talks about the tech stuff right. that we do it's not that. even it's not even entertaining probably not even like really understood but like mm -hmm. we still do all the product testing and you know we have 
all of our IP is our own and like all of the product that we created is, yeah. it's very technical. Um, yeah. And we've raised $6 million in venture capital. Like there's all these things that we've done that a startup does, but yeah. it's not what happens in the music industry. Right. You're also. not chatting about that with artists. No, I wouldn't imagine. No. So it's like you definitely change hats. For sure. Yeah, totally. It must keep it fresh in that sense, though. You can kind of shift in and out of these worlds where you have these really interesting conversations that sometimes, you know, aren't going to touch on this topic or that topic. And probably at times, too, it might be helpful where something stressful going on in one world, you can kind of step out of it for a second and just get away from it for a moment and uh, and refresh by speaking about something completely different. I mean, I, the, the level of burnout in the startup world is huge. And so for me, it's the fuel, like to go and see a show, um, to be part of a festival, to speak to an artist, like that's the fuel for me. I wouldn't actually be able to do what I do if I didn't go and fuel up every thought, you know, like every week, basically I do something. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. One I didn't consider, but it makes complete sense. Yeah. You kind of fuel yourself through, you know, keep, keep growing the business through that. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. Well, I was thinking maybe we could skip on over into a new segment here, Laura, um, a Q&A discovery. We can just kind of continue this back and forth. And this first question I have lined up is a little bit more of your backstory, I suppose, of, you know, I'm guessing here that music and all that it encompasses has been a big part of your life. I mean, obviously, you've forged a path here with a, a business built around it. Um, so maybe we kind of go back into that before, you know, you got into the business side of things, were there like some formative experiences when you were young? Did you play instruments yourself? Were you in music sort of, did you have a band? I don't know. Like what, what, what sort of led you down this path? Um, the top, yeah, the top question I get asked is, are you an artist yourself? Um, and I would say, no, uh, I do know how to play instruments, but I never got to that stage of playing my piano or clarinet or guitar that I felt comfortable just sitting down and noodling, which is, is yeah. for me, it's like a barrier that you cross over and now you're comfortable and you can just play around. Okay. Um, I was very dutifully doing lessons in piano and that sort of thing, but couldn't get to the level of where I was admiring, you know, my friends at this, at the yeah. time doing, making a band. So I would go to see my friends play in all ages club when I was um, a teenager. And I think I got, the bug to do what I do because um, they'd show up at the, at this gr grimy little club and play their hearts out and then not get paid what they were promised. And I would be the muscle who would go up to the club owner and be like, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, and you You're promised. Yeah. Way. It was up to your face. <laughs> and so I think that experience of peripherally understanding what was happening and trying to support my friends and just being like a total music nut um, from an early age, that that really propelled me. And so I eventually uh, got into music photography um, and journalism. And so I was doing live music photography specifically, um, like on the stage with the artist before digital cameras, so film cameras. Nice. Um, and then I, you know, when I was doing music journalism, that kind of took me in a direction for a while. Like I was a journalist for seven years doing actual, you know, I would call it real journalism, you know, mm -hmm. political journalism, crime, um, wow. social issues, all that sort of thing. Um, and it wasn't until a job popped up at a music nonprofit that I kind of made the switch back to music. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Were there any like business sort of experiences in there as well? Like, did you dip your toes at all into that side during that time? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I don't I don't think I ever thought about it until lately. Um, but my mom was a small business owner and she ran her business out of our house. And I worked for her from a very young age. So I did basically all the hats. I did deliveries. It was a court reporting business. So she went into like hearings and discoveries and they would record um, the proceedings on cassette at the time and then bring it back to our house and transcribe. And so she had like 35 employees working from remotely. She had a mostly remote workforce, but some in our house. And then, you know, like, so I grew up with this office in our basement. Oh, nice. And sometimes I do like accounting. I did all the, I went to the chamber of oh, commerce nice. meetings with her. And um, I don't think I really thought about how much that influenced me, mm. both seeing her as a, 
as a leader, a business leader and, yeah. and running this company, but also just learning the ins and outs of managing people and what that takes and just like all the different parts of it. So that I think set me up, but I never went to business school. I did an arts degree. <laughs> okay. Okay. So all right. yeah, no, I started, no, like I had a couple of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I had a little, like, I did start two other, well, three, two other businesses and one other event, but like, I never had any formal training. There was no, there was no school involved. Right. right. But as you said, I mean, that, that certainly must've played into it all. Like you said, just sort of witnessing it and being part of it, you know, taking on some of those roles and helping out. And uh, you know, how could that not have some sort of like rub off effect on you, I suppose at that age, you know, whatever age you were at that time, but in your youth at some point. Um, but it's interesting. You know, I find these talks really, uh, you know, quite compelling in that sense with, you know, various guests who have these, these moments in their lives. Sometimes they are aware of them, consciously aware of this could lead to X, Y, and Z, or other times, not at all. But somehow, yeah. some way, these things sort of like marry themselves together and they come back around and, uh, and yeah, interesting things are born out of it. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think it's really, really quite interesting. You kind of like connect the dots. As I'm listening here, I've kind of, maybe you are as well as we talk through it, but uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. Okay. It all makes well, sense in high. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? Not often things do, often things do. Well, fast forwarding a little bit here. Um, I know one of the companies that you did start up was the Syrup Factory, this Halifax based um, uh, live performance center. At least that's how it started, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. It started. Yeah. So it's, it's um, the Syrup Factory in 2011, we had our first house concert in our house that we still live in. And we decided to call our house the Syrup Factory because they're used, it's a very old house. I think it was built in 1917. And there used to be a cordial making factory in the backyard, like a very small one. Really? And so we called it the Syrup Factory and just mm -hmm. making sweet things happen, basically. Um, and then when I came back from Los Angeles to start my artist services company, I adopted that same name for the company. So okay. the Syrup Factory is actually, in a lot of people's minds, a music venue because I've had, mm. I don't know, dozens of concerts over the years, so um, maybe for the hundreds, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> So uh, that's that's where it, where it came from was, um, yeah, just my house. Okay, okay, interesting. I'm going to rewind just a second here, just a little bit here. In terms of that experience of going out to, to Los Angeles for four months, I found this really interesting when I was kind of digging into your past here. Um, this mentorship sort of experience with the former president of Warner Brothers Records. I mean, for one, I think like my image, at least like a, a mentorship experience might be, you know, you might get a couple hours, you might get 30 minutes, perhaps. And maybe if you're lucky, you might get, you know, once a week for a month or something like that, you know, within the business world. But for you were actually out there for four months in Los Angeles. I mean, that from a business standpoint of your own development must have been quite formative. And then also just from a life altering sort of standpoint and what that's led to. I'm guessing that there are some connections here to not only how you evolved the syrup factory, of course, but then also down the line, you know, and what you're doing with side door. Maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, I so at the time I was working as a funding program officer. So at this nonprofit, it basically I was given a budget to um, help distribute to artists and industry people to grow their businesses and expand their audience. And through that, I got to learn about this company in Los Angeles that was supporting one of the artists. So she was um, the former president of Warner Brothers Records. They did an artist services company, but it was really unique. They didn't take a commission of their um, creative output. They just, you know, they charged a fee based on the exact project details that was custom made for each artist. Okay. And I thought this was a really fair way of running a business, especially where, um, you know, I really believe an artist retaining as much of the rights of their creative output as possible. Yeah. So I had followed her story a little bit. This um, founder of this company, he was the uh, president of Warner Brothers. And then it came time to like kind of figure out what I was doing with my life. And meanwhile, because I, I wasn't I was kind of like hitting a ceiling. I didn't really know what else to do. And meanwhile, my husband, who was a filmmaker, um, his world kind of fell apart because 
we have something that's basically a vehicle for helping films happen in our province called the film tax credit. And that was axed by the government. And he became very active in trying to put back in place something to attract film crews to come and shoot here. Cause we had a huge, we had the fourth largest um, filming community in Canada. Wow. And then that all stopped when we, when we lost the film tax credit. So he became actively involved in that. At the same time I had been accepted for this mentorship, we were all as a family supposed to go to Los Angeles together and actually go for a year. Oh, no and instead he was like, I got to stay and fight this all single dad it with our two young kids at the time they were five and six wow. and you go and go for four months. And so I, I literally as a young mother got to take a sabbatical from my life, which I don't really know many people who get to do that. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so he is amazing and took the reins of the family. And I, yeah, went to Los Angeles for four months and just like, just lived and breathe everything music. I went to three shows a week. I took the bus. I just saved all my money, like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I just, just like really worked so hard yeah, you're, you're and in training for the whole like startup sort I, of thing, the bootstrapping yeah. Oh, yeah. and all that stuff yeah 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 and the and the woman so the woman I worked for the company was called Black Box Livia, Livia Tortella is her name um they're still a company but they ran it out of her house in just um near uh near Hollywood and so I would bus like 45 minutes into the, her house every day and we worked out of her pool house <laughs> <laughs> and uh like I knew her family like she yeah. her her brother was like the in-house cook who would cook lunch for us every day oh, and uh it was unreal like we used, yeah. yeah we used to we used to work on really like amazing artist campaigns that um I'll never forget and just like learning how to be in the largest music industry in the world was so formative because I just realized that nobody really cares what happens in Canada <laughs> and you are really going to make it big to make it big. So yeah, you know, are we striving for the 1% or are we striving for like sustainability? Right. That's exactly. sort of where that started coming out. Okay. Okay. It must've been really interesting kind of returning to you know, something we we're speaking about earlier where you were, or you're learning how to kind of marry these two worlds together, like the, the, the business side of it, right? Obviously this is a business and you're out to, you know, to, to make money and to make a living. But then also you do have that artistry side of it as well. And how do you, you know, appease both sides and probably the experiences and some of the insights that you're you're gathering during that time must have been really, really helpful in kind of piecing it all together. And, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think I, if, if that is a theme that we're picking up in this conversation, I think it's true. Like you think about how many people are able to be creative and like logistical at the same time, very do those things very well. Yeah. Um, it's difficult or financial management and creative, you know, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. really hard to do all the things. And so there's a necessary need for in our business when you're trying to grow your career to be good at both things or at least have a good team. Yeah. Yeah. But making that fair is maybe it's the tough. biggest question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. This might be a good time to kind of segue into a discussion on Side Door. I think what you do there is really quite interesting. And uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of all that, uh, maybe we could lead off the discussion, uh, the relationship with your co-founder, Dan Mangan, who's, of course, an accomplished artist himself, awarded musician, actually had him on the show earlier this summer and such a delightful guy. Like, Maybe we could kind of find out or listeners would like to know how that came about, the relationship there. And then maybe from that point, you know, how, how do you both contribute to the business? Yeah, so we um, came at it from different sides of the coin or different sides of the problem. And um, basically, I had been trying, I, I was still in Los Angeles. I was thinking about how successful the house concerts had been at my house and how that low overhead, high ROI model really works for artists. Most of the time they're taking 100% of the door and the audience and the host of those shows are just doing it because they want that intimate experience. And um, as you mentioned in your intro, that is that experience that I always am craving and going after. Um, so he was doing that as an artist to grow his career. He was doing house concerts. So he had started it um 
the idea of trying to help artists that he was supporting by letting them do like connecting them with other hosts to enable them to do little shows and grow their career. So he was basically saying, this is what I did in my career. You should do it in your career. So it was very small batch, um, you know, basically like reach out to people, get a spreadsheet, match up which artists could go with what host. So he was doing that on the West coast of the country on the East coast of the country. I was still trying to figure out how to make this into a company, but I was looking more at the administrative side, the technical, the logistical side. How do I take the, what I do and make it into a platform because I'd done a little dabbling. Yeah. Like just streamline it so that anybody could do it. Um, And then a, a mutual friend of ours, knew what both of us were working on and he introduced us uh, on Facebook Messenger (laughs) and said you guys are working on the same thing you should meet Um, and of course I had heard of Dan Um, his reputation preceded him and we met when he was on tour here in Halifax and hit it off and that's where it started no way Oh, yeah. It's also exciting. Also exciting. And, and I think I might have been listening to you. I'm researching for this talk. I guess, uh, maybe it was a, another podcast or it could have been an article written up. Like one of the, the things, you know, the, the big benefits of your platform on the artistry side is something you spoke about earlier, where, you know, artists go to these venues at times and the most awkward time of the, the evening is after the show where it's time to pay up. And, you know, and sometimes these hosts maybe don't pay what they're supposed to. And it creates these really uncomfortable and awkward sort of situations. And I find it really interesting. Like it's something as simple as that can be just like completely wiped off the table. And it's just, it's nice, it's easy. And it makes for just this really rich experience from start to finish for an artist. And then even also for the hosts themselves too. It just kind of takes that sort of that element, I don't know if this is the right word, but that dirty element of the passing of the cash, like, here you go, here you go for the, for the performance, you know, and it takes that right out. And I just find that, you know, such a, such an elegant way of, uh, of, of just making the whole experience that much better, I suppose, for lack yeah. of a better word. Yeah. The financial piece was the first thing we created. And for that reason, it splits yeah. the, um, you make the smart contract. So you yeah. know what the split's going to be before the show. It splits the money at the point of sale, holds in an escrow, and then it's paid out to people's bank accounts after the show has happened. So it, there's never any question that that money is going to be paid. Um, and it's all accounted for by us, this you know, side door being the third party. So yeah, right. you get to enjoy the show and not worry about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like that's, that's one thing that struck me. And then just the second one, I mean, just as somebody like as a consumer, potentially, like if you want to have that intimate experience at your own house or, you know, somewhere else, like you can create it. I just find that really, you know, compelling as well. I mean, who, who doesn't want that? It seems like the, the day and age that we live in, it seems like what a lot of people are always after. They want, they, they want that stuff for their phones to take the pictures of, look at this amazing experience I've been part of outside of the musical, you know, sort of element. There, there's that to it as well that I find really quite interesting that people I think would naturally be drawn to. Um, but then of course, just on the musical side of things, just having that small intimate performance, you know, at your own home must be just an amazing sort of like memorable sort of life experience for someone. So yeah, you can see how, you know, those are just two elements right there, but I'm sure there's several others that, uh, that make your, you know, services quite unique in that sense. So, yeah. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I do have another question here and this is, or maybe not the cheeriest of questions, I suppose, but in terms of what's happened in the last, you know, few years, it's hard to ignore, obviously, with uh, the pandemic. And for a company like yours, it must have been a fairly challenging time for obvious reasons. But I do understand that you did uh, pivot a little bit to, to kind of, you know, find your way through it. Maybe you could share with listeners what, what it is that you did do. I mean, live performances were more or less being cut around the world, right, during that time. So what, what did Side Door do? to to kind of manage that um yeah so we by 2019 was when we launched our platform that basically automated everything i just described like it was kind of the dream was the baseline entry point of this was our offering it was our 1.0 and things were automated start to fit finish so technically somebody an artist and a host could match they could create a show they could do the show and get paid out and we didn't necessarily have to help with them with that because it was a well-designed product. Yeah. So 80 to 90% of the shows were happening without any human intervention whatsoever. 
Um, and then when the pandemic hit in 2020, we were actually ramping up to do a huge partnership with South by Southwest. So we were going to tour artists from their hometowns to um, Austin, Texas, and just demonstrate like how we can help, you know, boost their revenue and their, you know, content up on their socials and just really help them out in a time of need. Yeah. And when they canceled South by Southwest, that was one of the first festivals to really, you know, topple the rest of everything else. It was right at the beginning of March. Mm -hmm. And we <laughs> spent one night canceling all of the shows. And then within 10 days, because Dan and I had always worked remotely, like he's been in Vancouver and I'm in Halifax, yeah. he and I had always used Zoom. So we were very familiar with Zoom. And he suggested, he was like, well, maybe, maybe we could try something on Zoom. And I, I actually, the first, the first thing we did was I was like, maybe artists could do something on Zoom that's not music because we didn't know how that was going to go, right? right? It's just right. sound yeah, yeah. and everything. All new, of course, yeah. And so I actually did a show, a show on Zoom that was, I forget, I think we cobbled something together for ticketing. We used our own ticketing, but I, I don't know how we did it with Zoom. Mm -hmm. We, it was a very much like human computering, like behind okay. the curtains happening. Um, and we did like a makeup tutorial with a friend of mine who was an artist just for something yeah. fun. Cause people were like, yeah. just needed something light. Um, and then he did a show 10 days after the lockdown and it was like, I cried. I called him on FaceTime. I was just crying because I was like, I can't believe how that felt mm -hmm. because we all could see each other. That was the thing is that on yeah. Zoom, we all had our cameras on. We were all interacting. We we're all, re to me, like live performance isn't about consumption. It's about interaction. So yeah. it's like, how do you get that? How do you actually get that energy when you're online? And so that's what we focused on is interactivity during the pandemic. And so we did 1200 plus shows, um, wow. built out all sorts of things. We eventually did broadcast shows. We eventually like added closed captioning. We did all these technical supports. Um, we were helping people Chromecast to their TVs. Like we were, <laughs> we were doing so Nailed many it. things yeah. that we never imagined we were going to do. Um, and it was just based out of need. It was, we, there, we could not do it. We would have been sunk. And we also knew that there was a huge, disaster if artists couldn't figure out how to reach an audience like yeah. they would they'd be sunk yeah yeah well, it was an interesting time in that in that sense for obvious reasons but again like the day and age that we live in right now it's kind of aligned for that like for that pivot to to occur i mean everyone has a phone in hand everyone's capable of, of watching wherever whenever they want right so that's that was in your favor i suppose and the tech being as evolved as it is you know i'm sure there were still some challenges along the way but at least you know you could do these things you could embed closed captioning as you mentioned and probably live chats and different things like yep. you could sort of integrate a lot of these elements to still kind of build up you know, some of this intimacy in different manners or different ways, shapes or forms. So I can see how, you know, things in that sense would have aligned. And, uh, and yeah, I think also just like, it's kind of inherent in what your business is all about. You know, you have artists who themselves without the show is like, what were they doing? Like they're dying themselves probably to, to perform in any way on in, in any shape or, you know, uh, in any manner. Um, and then of course, you know, your business itself desperate at that point you're still in that startup land where you need to find ways so i can see how it would have sort of been pieced together and uh and probably i'm sure it's made your business that much stronger now now that you have this whole different you know option i suppose for artists and even for for you guys as a different type of service yeah i mean we when we were in the middle of it we had this feeling of well first of all i don't think anybody really knew if it was when it was going to be done or if it was going to be done or that it wasn't going to be done even, you know? Um, and so we didn't, we kind of foresaw that online shows would stay with us for a while, but we just recently decided to not do online shows anymore. Mm. Um, and it was because after doing it for two years, their, you know, the competitors came out of the woodwork. Um, they focused just on that. They had a really good product. People didn't want to do Zoom shows. And, yeah. Or, in, or online shows at all as much anymore. We it just started to dry up, even in the thick of it. And so we made the decision in the middle of Omicron last, you know, winter, to 
remove online shows from our our plan in okay. eight months. And so to, to this is the thing about you know making a decision in startup life is you're you're planning for a future that is really uncertain. Yeah. And I I just I'm so glad we made that choice because it, it's pretty obvious now that that's not something that people want to do as much, if at all, especially on the artist side. Um, so we went back to in-person shows, but it's like being a baby startup all over again, starting from where we left off and going back to that. Exactly. What yeah. an experience, you know, for, for any business during that time, no less one that had started just right when it had all begun with the pandemic. Mm. There. But again, I'm sure, you know, as cliche as it sounds, like I'm sure it's made, you know, you and your business that much stronger and, and found ways to kind of like manage your own sort of emotions and whatnot and, and trying to work through through some fairly challenging times. So yeah, I'm sure there's some things there that, uh, you know, in the moment are hard to recognize, but, you know, in hindsight, again, in hindsight, looking back, you, you could probably pick out a few things there that, uh, you know, you've integrated into to how you run your business now. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I do want to shift over into a new segment here, a water cooler story segment. And this is a segment where I just ask guests to indulge listeners with a story related to their profession. You've already shared a couple here, but uh, I'd be curious if you have anything else for us. Um, gosh, I think I love, you know, I think raising money in my world is something that I was really uncomfortable doing. Um, and the ways that we've been able to raise funds for this company um, has really affected me. Like not anybody is going to invest. We're not like a fast, like obvious company to invest in. Like you kind of need to know a little bit about the music industry and you've got to trust us yeah. to invest. And um, I guess one story is I, I met um the drummer for our, our lady peace through a mutual friend and he ended up investing and he said you should meet my lawyer friend um he would probably invest as well and so i did i went to toronto and i met with him and he um had this story about his son how much his son loved um music and he ended up taking his own life when he was about 19 and he said if my son had what you're doing I think he would have an outlet like he would have a way to express himself in a way that wasn't so soul-sucking because it it the industry can be really really tough and um I don't know it was such a heavy conversation but and such a lot of responsibility to think about taking investment money and the responsibility of like how do we create something that his son would use and be proud and he would be proud to be investing in like, but every time those stories of why people invest in our company come up like that to me is, you know, I take that capital very seriously. Like this is the capital that somebody has entrusted with us to do amazing things with. And so that one story in particular was one that always stays with me. It's like <laughs> what we're do actually doing here matters, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's certainly a heavy one. But you're right. I mean, music is funny. Like, that, that, I think that's one of the things that makes music so special, you know, is that I mean, it connects people in so many different ways. And it, you know, it really plays with our psyche and, and how we interpret the world and, you know, how we interact with the world, essentially, right. And it guides us through difficult times, it kind of, you know, accentuates other moments in our lives and uh we're all tied into it in some way shape or form i guess and uh, a story like that on your side hearing it you, know, you have the business side of trying to to get the funds obviously the capital to keep your business going and to, to grow it but hearing that you know how could that not have an impact on you you know the the, the pressures obviously one but also even the honor as well of somebody entrusting you know you to to take these ideas forward and uh and grow grow your business in honor of in this case, that, that person or that, that young man. So yeah, I'd imagine uh, over the course of just running this business, you probably would have had several, you know, stories, you know, maybe as deep as that, but some other lighter ones as well. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's a, uh, that's one that quite honestly, I wouldn't have been expecting, but, um, but in, all in the best way, I mean, that in the best possible way, it's a, it's a really touching story. So thank you. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I do want to shift over into a new segment here, a last segment, actually, the crystal ball segment, as the name implies, we're looking to the future, you know, trends, predictions, so on and so forth. And this question here, I mean, again, returning to this acknowledgement of music and all that it means is it's like this pure sort of medium that when it's done live and it's done well, it produces this, like this visceral sort of reaction. Uh, in people. And I, I would even venture to say that like biologically and evolutionally speaking, like we as humans have like just come to, to almost seek it out. You know, we, we, there's a certain appreciation that cuts across culture. So that being said, like, I just don't ever see a world where live performance is ever going to be phased out. However, on the other hand, I also don't see a world in which like technology is not going to try to get in there and infiltrate it you know, that, that world and maybe steal certain aspects away. So here's the question is how do you see like these two sort of worlds, like music itself, and then the integration of technology, obviously your platform technology is allowing these, you know, these experiences to take shape form, you know, take, well, to help people experience it in different ways. But I'd be curious to see or to hear like how you think this is going to evolve even further from now. And technology and music what, what type of integration are we looking at down the line i mean you know i'm pretty i i keep up on the trends of what's happening and to be honest the cynic in me sees a lot of things i'm not excited about in the future mm. um you know there's a story recently of the ai generated um hip-hop artist that was really offensive to a lot of people um, but had a ton of followers at the same time. And it just kind of brought out this really ugly side yeah. of the industry. Um, but I think that, you know, how can I, I guess I, I, I used to run an off grid event where I would take people's cell phones away and devices and we would spend four days together and there'd be like workshops. We were at a kid's camp. So we do like climbing and like, boating and stuff like that and um i still am like in community with those people because i think what they were seeking is something that i'm trying to provide is a space where you are childlike and creative and free and really present in the moment and so what are what we're fighting for and to create in the future is more of that space, like really blocking that out for people and making it normal uh, to seek it out um, and not make it, like I said, a consumptive action mm -hmm. to, um, you know, see how many songs you have in your playlist and like skip through the first 30 seconds, but actually like, can, are you connecting with what's happening in this song? Are you understanding what the, you know, your, your interpretation of it you know how does that move you how does that change your experience next time you speak with somebody or you act with somebody like that to me is the human capacity building of art mm -hmm. and so i would just my crystal ball if i was to be hopeful and not a cynic is to create more space for that just to provide the creator especially um some space which means like taking care of them in a in a financial and a logistical way but also for the audience where it's just okay like you you sanction that space for them to experience that mm -hmm. yeah i mean i've heard uh certain artists you know for per, uh, performances where like they have requests from the audiences when they come in drop off your cell phone they put in a little baggie and uh you know and that's it and, like and I, I you know of course to kind of preserve what you're just speaking of there you know that, that the almost purity of the experience and allowing people to actually like digest what's happening before them and think and consider and, and really take in all the different elements of what that performance offers mm -hmm. and uh yeah it is a concern I, I suppose you know if you're not feeling all that optimistic, you know, you're caught in that moment where there is a bit of a worry there, you know, are, are we going to lose that, you know? And uh, yeah, I mean, being this show being based uh, out of Asia within Japan, there's been a lot of development there in terms of a lot of their pop music and with AI and these virtual characters. I think I just saw something yesterday out of South Korea where it's pop idols that are just being generated and they're amassing these huge amount of followers and, you know, they're having these AI generated performances all over the place. And, and that's fine. I guess if that's what you're after, but at the same time, like 
the ripple effects on, on that of that into other realms is is a bit concerning i suppose but again kind of seesawing back over onto the the side of optimism i think there is again this purity of of music when done well and done right there's something even more powerful than than what anything anyone could automate or create digitally speaking so i think there is still some hope there and uh you know i would uh i would tend to, to kind of be on your side for that so yeah let's hope let's hope but uh i i it's an interesting time i guess like I, the reason i brought that question up i think you know not just within the music industry but across industries like I think people are trying to figure out how do we sort of harness a lot of this technological advancement who's just been, you know, been tons in so many different ways, right? And like in, in all sorts of businesses, how do we harness it? How do we use it in the best possible way? But at the same time, preserve certain elements that have made things special within the businesses or services themselves. And it's just this kind of back and forth, I suppose. And uh, within the music industry, you know, that example we were just speaking of right there, you know, it really speaks volumes to it. Um, it's going to be really quite interesting to see it all unfold. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I must say, Laura, it's been a really, you know, true, true pleasure in, uh, in speaking with you today. You know, I've really enjoyed the conversation, learning a little bit more about your background and of course, side door. Um, yeah, I would encourage anyone to, to certainly go uh, check out all of what you offer, you know, in terms of your business, and uh, perhaps they might be able to, to line up a concert or, or intimate show at their own place sometime soon. So thanks again. for Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, again, for those interested in learning more about Laura and her work, you can find her at Side Door. Also, she's on LinkedIn and Twitter. And for reference, all of that information will be included in the show notes. Um, and also, too, if you like today's show, please be sure to share. You know, it goes a long way. So it helps way more than you could ever know. You can also rate, review, and subscribe wherever you access your podcasts. And also, we did launch a channel on YouTube in the last year. You can head on over there, and you'll notice, you know, it needs a bit of love. So if you, you like what you're seeing there, you know, hit, this, hit that uh, subscribe button. Um, the interesting thing there is that we will have these visual overlays of you know, imagery associated with the talks, so you can kind of take it in in a different manner. So yeah, please be sure to, to, uh, to check that out. And then finally, don't forget to tune into the next episode of Life As A, where we'll continue to explore and unearth the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. Until next time, stay curious about life and living. <laughs>